So um, we've got uh, lecture C, so I guess this is the third one. And what we're doing right at the moment um, for this particular semester, we have three projects. First of all, we're going to start out with the basics with board design, um, with uh, characters and pieces, and then we will do a kind of a half Zork, half kind of Japanese RPG using Ren PY. And then the last one, um, we will be using BuildBox to create a side-scrolling game. Um, what's currently due? Okay. Um, what we have in the uh, teacher's learning materials is um, the uh, case, uh, let's see here, case study. I want you to um, study one to three games. The thing is, is that what's really important is for you to, you know, get the idea of what the idea, what's the theme of the game, what's the history, and what's, you know, what does it do? Are there characters? Because, uh, I mean, even chess has characters, as we'll see. Um, how does the game work? And can you... You know what, can you make what they call a mod? Can you modify this game to be something you want it to be? Can you put your face on, on this game? Okay. Uh, secondly, then we're going to talk about your board game design because you should have something together by now. Uh, because you got to start making it. So it's been about, it's our beginning of our third week. And so there are just some things here. It's like what sort of images are going to support your theme? So in our program, this is primarily a animation and multimedia program. So we're really heavily anime based uh, and Disney and all that sort of thing. So, you know, what my thought is is that, you know, let's just, let's construct a narrative around, um, you know, around, uh, around some characters that we want to develop. Hopefully, that you want to develop possibly as an early version of the characters in your senior project. Hint, 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 hint. In other words, things that wait a second, wait a second, does he want me to start thinking about my senior project already? And I said, yes, I do. Um, you know, I want you to think if there's this story that's been in your head that y you are just absolutely obsessed with that you have to tell. And I'm ready to let you keep developing that story for as long as you want, but that's it. Um, okay, so like, what's your ideas? What's the players? You know, what's the players? Are they characters? Are there, you know, how do they work? And then, you know, what do they have to get through? So we'll talk about all this in class. So, yeah, the, the notion is that in any game, you've got this idea of, of a journey of some sort, or some, basically, the idea of play that involves actions and overcoming challenges to reach goals. And whether you've got like a Parcheesi piece, which is just a little, you know, little thing, or like a pawn, a chess pawn, it still, it, it, it still embodies something. It still is kind of almost somebody or something that has a little bit of life to it. So the thing is, is that you need to consider who are your characters and how do they influence gameplay. And, um, I mean, we can go way back. I was going to say in the beginning there's Dungeons and Dragons, you know, but I mean, we're talking about video games. You know, really kind of the the... The seminal thing for video games is probably Dungeons and Dragons. And then, you know, but of course the original war game, 
chess. And, uh, you know, based off the Indian game Chaturanga, and um, has different versions throughout, um, you know, China, Persia, Japan, all that sort of thing, you know. So, of course. And, but nevertheless, consider that, you know, you know, the, the pawns are just, you know, your, your everyday, like, infantry person just going out and doing what the, you know, what the people in power and back, you know, like the queen and the king and bishop and all these sorts of things. Um, okay. And here you see the king. King. But, you know, you can see here, you know, there's a characterization to the pieces which give them, give them life, give the char gives the game character. And, um, oh, that's interesting. Ein Soldat. It's a, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Ein Soldat, that's the, that's the pawn. And, uh, That's interesting. Derman. Huh. So is that the um, is that the bishop? That's very interesting. Anyway, okay. So no matter what game we have, even if say for example in the case of Candyland, we are still these kids who are trying to get away from the fact that we're recovering from polio. You know, so nevertheless, there's something for us to identify with. Uh, one thing that I'm going to say is that there is a, there's actually a neuroscientist, and this doesn't have a slide, named, um, oh, BJ, I can't, can't remember his name, but he, he's one of the people who discovered the fact that we have this thing called the um, uh, Vijay Ramachandran. And he discovered that in our brains we have this kind of like this parallel set of neurons called the mirror, mirror cortex. And even if we're playing with dolls or something like that, the thing is, is that, and this is how we learn, you identify with what what is being said or being shown or whatever. <laughs> and you reconstruct this in your, in your mind using the, the, the mirror cortex. So, um, so the thing is, is that, you know, we create uh, characters to kind of take ourselves on our own adventures. So in the beginning, there's Dungeons and Dragons, um, and I think I'm going to leave these on, let's see here, what time is it? I'll play this. There's a new version of Dungeons and Dragons that's coming. Actually, it's mostly here. It's called the 5th edition, which is a lot of editions. So why did we need so many of them? So back in the 1970s, this guy named Gary Gygax created a tabletop game called Chainmail. It was kind of like a medieval version of Risk, uh, but pretty quickly he and his buddy Dave Arneson started messing with the rules, and it turned into something completely different. It turned into a role-playing game, and we call it Dungeons and Dragons. Back then, D&D was all about having a lot of friends around a table and telling each other stories about what their characters were doing in an imaginary world. There are all sorts of rules about how to swing a sword, creating fireballs, and figuring out key stats. 
which led to the first edition of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. AD&D was really cool, but it kind of caused a moral panic. Pat Robertson got on the 700 Club, and he told Christians that D&D was demonic and dangerous. What people have surrendered absolutely evil, but they're allowed cameras to record their dark rituals. With the no. evidence appears. He basically drives him crazy, and he's up crying harder than James Vanderbeek at Dawson's Creek. <laughs> So they pulled out some of this demon stuff and cleaned up a bunch of complicated rules and they released Advanced D&D 2nd Edition in 1989. Yeah. It basically turned into a golden age of D&D. All sorts of people started playing and we got crazy new worlds to play in. There was a high fantasy world, vampire world, desert world. We had D&D in space with these creepy creatures called mind flayers who had tentacles instead of mouths. That was all great, but fast forward to 1997, and a new company owns D&D, and they release a super complicated version, and then another version that focused too much on tabletop play. And then a competing game called Pathfinder, which is actually based on the older D&D rules, started to be more popular than D&D itself. So, we get this crazy nerd fight that everybody calls the Edition Wars, where gamers are all playing different versions of D&D or Pathfinder and just trying to find people who you want to roll dice with and kill some floating tentacle-eyed beholders is worse than arguing about iPhones and Androids. All of which is why we have this new 5th edition of D&D. It goes back to its roots with simpler rules and more creativity. It's trying to win back all those people who left during the edition wars. If they pull it off, it could be a resurrection for the franchise. Pat Robertson would be proud. So I personally think it's a little, a little, little too complex because there's all these different races and all these things and all this sort of thing. It's like, okay, fine. But, so Dungeons and Dragons leads to Zork, which is one of the first um, text-based video games. And I used to play this a lot. when a game combines good storytelling with a bone-rattling soundtrack and jaw-dropping graphics. But some of the greatest adventures ever were actually brought to life by this console. Imagine that. The year is 1976. Video game fans are playing Atari's breakout hit in the arcade. Hooked on the gameplay and graphics. But four MIT programmers are addicted to adventure. A Dungeons and Dragons inspired text game with imaginary gameplay and no graphics. It's all in their heads. Being picky uh, programming types, we had a lot of complaints about it. It was a two-word parser, you know, kill, dwarf, eat, dragon, whatever. Really simple stuff. So we, you know, said, oh, we can do a better job than that. And so we did. January 1977, Leveling and Team begin programming an epic game set in the great underground empire with its menacing ruler, Lord Dimwit Flathead. These guys are so buried in code that they forget to name their game. Someone tags it Zork, MIT jargon for an unfinished project. The name sticks, even though it's finished and ready to play in just six months. Zork was written in a language called Muddle allowed very easy writing, very easy debugging, very easy prototyping. So you could sit down and cobble together a prototype of an area of the game in a couple of hours. And then you could have people play it very quickly. Like today's viral videos shared by friends, university students catch Zork fever across the nation. Thanks to email. Yep, email on the ARPANET ancestor to the internet. They dial up MIT's mainframe day and night to play Zork, 
and embark on a dangerous adventure and a puzzling treasure hunt with a mysterious white house at its core. Playing is simple. Type in any reasonable English sentence. The game understands and follows your command. So if you said, take axe, there would be code associated with the axe that did anything special involving axes. If it's a magic axe, when you take it, it would say, as you pick up the axe, it begins to glow with a sinister blue glow. Zork hooks an MIT professor who urges Leveling and others to form a company and sell it. Enter Infocom. After two years of tweaks, Zork 1 hit stores in 1980 for just about every popular system of the day. Apple, Atari, Commodore, IBM, and it goes gangbusters, becoming the top-selling game software of 1981, 82, 83, and 84. Total sales, $20 million. I think if you look at technologies today, you will see that one of the things that people really hunger for is connection with another intelligent, sympathetic entity. One of the things that made games like Zork popular is you got the feeling when they worked right, you were talking to somebody who was listening, somebody who was responding in a way that another human would respond to you. Zork and sequels Zork 2, The Wizard of Froboz, and Zork 3, The Dungeon Master, sell a total of 900,000 units before Infocom is bought by Activision in 86. A bunch of text adventures follow, some created by leveling. But to this day, the majority of critics and fans deem Zork the quintessential text title. It's incredibly gratifying that after 30 years, even now, I run into people who were influenced by Zork. Some of them, of course, are people who weren't even born when the games were written. My wife, I think, has put it best. Well, you're semi-famous. <laughs> so there you go. That's Zork. And then, of course, you know what that goes on to? That then goes on to something called Ultima which is basically the first role-playing game that has graphics, which you're saying, what? You know, yeah, there's, there's actually graphics. You know, so there were, there were times... I may cut a little bit short on this one. So the other interesting thing, too, is that consider also with these things, there weren't, there wasn't any music either. So, you know, the Ultima series was very, very, very influential. Um, done by Sierra Online. Um, done by a guy, guy named Lord British. And one of the things that you'll see in episode three of... Um, High score is the fact that which is edited, my version is edited, um, is that you have morality involved. So instead of just running around, you know, just killing and ruining everything, you have, you know, people who have to make moral choices, which is really an interesting thing, and that continues to this day, like in Skyrim.
And then this brings us to Zelda. Which brings us into, you know, the, the major notion of the franchise. Like, the interesting thing about Zelda is the fact that, you know, all the stories aren't in a chronological order. They are all over the place. I think the first Zelda story was a 2010 release. So, but, once again, you know, here we have, we have various, you know, voices and, uh, and stories and such, and so... That's going to be a little bit in number two. And then, lastly, the big franchise. But hey guys, the game. Louie is back again with a new evolution video. Before getting started, please and make I'm just going to just go forward a little bit. You can see this in the P at PowerPoint. And this is really just the evolution of the, you know, the, the gaming Elder Scrolls. So you can go get this from the PowerPoint. So. Hey guys. Here's the thing. So, um, where should we be? We should be in the idea, sketches, case study. Get your fi get your characters uh, finalized. Let's see, you know what what they look like on Wednesday, and really start getting into the board layout. So, um, A3 construction. Do it on Illustrator. And so it's like, what are the rules of the game? This is up to you. So if you want to get somewhere, rescue somebody, escape from somewhere, find something, collect bonus points. Who are the players? How many players can play? How many, do you, you know, is everybody going to follow the same path? And then where do you start? Where do you end? And, you know, how can you be held back? Uh, are there obstacles? Are there places where you can jump? Or, you know, are there little challenges? Are there lucky things? And the thing is, is that this may seem really kind of crazy, but the thing is, is that if, if you consider the original form of snakes and ladders in India, you're going up a tower. So... A landscape portrait, you know, a landscape layout isn't going to work for you, you know, or it's going to look kind of dumb. So anyway, so really think about this, and then you know you start you start playing around with you know where you're going to have people, where you're going to have your players start and end, and consider how many how many players you can have. Are they going on the same path? And how many start and finish points do you need? And the thing is, is that do you have multiple players going to the same spot? And that's important as well. So, I mean, it's your game. And then... Well, the thing is, is that um, I'm going to show you these two things, and then I'm going to break my own rules. I'm going to say, is it going to be side or top view, or, or guess what? Is it, uh, oh, sorry, and then gameplay considerations. In other words, are you going to have chance spots where you can jump, where you can get set back, you know, are there secret pathways, you know, and this can be part of your story. So this can be really cool. And consider snakes and ladders. Look, here's the here's the format. It's primarily just going around a grid, but you just you know the you're just going up and 
you're going basically around a grid, but however, the snake will take you back down, the ladder will take you up, and you know, you get up to the palace. So, um, you know, and then the thing is, is I'm saying for, you know, for, for your game, could you have somebody do something publicly? You know, that could be kind of fun. So, by Wednesday, I want you to start thinking about, you know, really laying out the board. How is this going to, how is this going to start coming together? And think about if you're going to have obstacles and advantage points and all these sorts of things. And 90% of you are animators, so I mean, you know, you're, you're more than able to, to draw things. And then think of where you're going to start and end. And the thing is, is at this point, really, by Wednesday, you know, I, I think it's good for you to be, you know, really have the characters in place. Know what your game mechanics are going to be. Know, know what your rules are going to be. By the way, you do need to write those out when you, when you hand this in. And, um, and then, you know, consider, you know, what your players look like. Because the thing is, is that, um, sorry, I have the, those points still there. But, you know, like Monopoly, you know, it has all these kind of things like, you know, like the car and the top hat and all these things that are really super famous. And then, you know, here we just have some Parcheesi things. Here we just have some dice. Are you going to use dice? Are you going to use cards? What are you going to do? Are you going to have a point where you maybe have a deck of chance cards? You know, that if you hit a certain, a certain one, you pick one of those up. That's an interesting consideration. So here are assignments and dates. So here where where we are at in the class. So the due date for everything is the 27th. And so you know what? There's there have been some students. I'll try to be maybe a little bit more clear, but the thing is is that my due dates as opposed to saying this is the due date this is the due date for everything. And there are implied deadlines for other things because I don't want you to do things all at the same time. So anyway, you should have the idea and the worksheet in. Uh, should have the first sketches in. So, and I want to go over your work definitely on Wednesday. And then basically, um, I'm going to give some lectures about, uh, about various aspects of game design. I'm going to assign an edited version of uh, Chapter 3, I mean, uh, Episode 3 of um, High Score, and have a short quiz on it on Wednesday. And then uh, we'll, I'll give you your, your basic ideas on the 20th. We will just uh, work on... Uh, the week of the 27th, and then everything is due as an illustrated file or a PDF file. And that's it. And then we'll get on to our other, other piece. So anyway, that's where we're at. Um,